Um, first of all, I'd like to thank um, Efren um, for inviting me. It's always a pleasure um, being involved in these um, conferences. Um, so I'll actually be talking about a topic that's very controversial currently. Um, this is worth an hour uh, lecture, but because of the constraints of time, I'll try to um, condense it to just 15, 20 minutes. And it's a topic that's very close to what Dr. Um, Garcia just talked about, okay? So for today, we're going to be talking about bronchopulmonary dysplasia um, and the role of steroids. So I have no relevant um, financial relationships to disclose nor conflicts of interest to resolve. Uh, this will be our lecture outline. Uh, we'll start with a background um, talking about the definitions um, of old BPD versus, BP versus the new BPD. We'll talk about the incidents, the risk factors. We'll talk a little bit about pathogenesis. Then we'll parlay to the different corticosteroids that are currently being used to treat and um, prevent BPD. And finally, uh, hopefully we'll be able to end it with uh, salient practice points, um, especially uh, with regard to the current evidence that we have now. Okay, So bronchopulmonary dysplasia is a major complication of prematurity, particularly in infants with respiratory distress syndrome. The risk is highest with extreme prematurity with at least 80% of infants who are born less than 25 weeks gestational age developing severe BPD. This is just a slide that shows you the risk factors for BPD. And again, just like ROP, the most significant risk factor is extreme prematurity. A significant issue when reviewing the literature on BPD is that the definition has changed over time. BPD was first identified in 1967 in a group of preterm infants who had required ongoing respiratory support after an initial period of oxygen and ventilation for respiratory distress. Much progress has since then been made with the introduction of widespread antenatal steroids, postnatal surfactant, more refined ventilatory strategies, and better nutrition. These factors have altered the pathology and clinical course of BPD and led to the revision of its definition. When we talked about old BPD, we talk about oxygen requirement at 28 days of life with um, radiographic findings consistent with airway injury, inflammation, parenchymal fibrosis due to prolonged mechanical ventilation and oxygen toxicity. New BPD, on the other hand, is accorded to infants who require oxygen at 36 weeks post-conceptual age. Its histology is characterized by extensive inflammation, decreased septation, alveolar hypoplasia, leading to fewer and larger alveoli and lesser surface area for gas exchange. Moreover, it involves vascular mild development resulting into the abnormal distribution of alveolar capillaries and the thickening of the muscular layer of the pulmonary arteries. If you're going to look at these two slides here, this uh, the one on top represents old BPD. Note extensive fibrosis, and this is all because of um, acute injury brought by prolonged and severe mechanical ventilation. In contrast, when you look at the histology of new BPD, you'll see um, that the normal honeycomb architecture of the lung has now been lost. You see a lot of inflammation. Um, and this actually um, differentiates it from the old BPD, the presence of a lot of inflammatory processes. This slide shows the evolution of the two definitions of BPD. Note that the new BPD occurs during the saccular stage of lung development, while the old BPD occurs at a much later stage. 
Note that the etiology of new BPD is multifactorial, ranging from prenatal risk factors and genetic predisposition to the postnatal environment largely characterized by inflammation, aggravated by volubar trauma and oxygen toxicity. This is a typical x-ray showing um, the difference between the old versus the new BPD. Um, on the left, will be an extra typical for old BPD showing areas of atelectasis and hyperinflation that you can see in both lung fields. When you talk about new BPD, you'll see diffuse opacification in both lung fields. Note that there's a lot of cystic changes here um, that's very representative of pulmonary interstitial emphysema. Um, as I said, BPD is largely a function of um, extreme prematurity and aggravated by whatever we do postnatally. And more and more, I'm beginning to see um, PIE changes, these cystic structures um, seen in very extremely premature babies as early as the second day of life. If you, these, these cystic changes are actually not seen that early in the old BPD. But since we're now resuscitating um, infants who are even 22 weaker, um, we get to see a lot of these PIE uh, changes on x-ray as early as the second day of life. Just to show you the sequential um, chest x-rays of an infant with BPD. Um, so this is an image um, of an infant who was born at 20, 25 weeks. The second image is, um, was taken two weeks later, which shows a coarsened interstitial pattern bilaterally and diffuse haziness. This um, next x-ray was taken five weeks from birth and note a worsening of the coarsening of the pulmonary markings. And the last um, x-ray here um, the baby had a PDA ligation, but note um, diffuse pulmonary congestion in both lung fields. A closer magnification of that particular image will show again the cystic structure that I was describing earlier. Um, you have all of these cystic structures, and actually sometimes this can even conglomerate to become bigger and bigger uh, cystic structures that will eventually form into a bleb. Um, this slide actually shows the progression um, of uh, BPD. What I want to um, stress here um, is the presence of inflammation, either as an etiology or as an aggravating factor for the development of BPD. With the strong inflammatory component of BPD established, it is reasonable to expect that anti-inflammatory treatments may be beneficial to prevent or treat BPD. As we all know, corticosteroids are powerful anti-inflammatory agents and have been used in a variety of inflammatory conditions. Um, our review this morning uh, will focus, well, evening for you guys, um, will focus primarily on the long-term outcomes following postnatal corticosteroids in preterm newborns to prevent or treat BPD. We will weigh up the benefits and risk in relation to timing, the mode of administration, and type of corticosteroids. Um, recommendations for the use of postnatal corticosteroids, uh, given the current evidence available, will also be presented during this discussion. An appreciation of the the history of postnatal corticosteroids is key to understanding why there just seems to be a lot of uncertainty regarding its use. Even now, there's no common um, uniformity um, in how neonatologists practice um, um, treating BPD with steroids. Um, as early as uh, the late 80s, several trials had shown that postnatal dexamethasone was very effective in facilitating extubation of the preterm infant. 
This was followed by the widespread use of dexamethasone to treat or prevent BPD. At that time, dexamethasone was um, being given very early on, usually around the first week of life, and at huge cumulative doses, as high as 8 milligram per kilo spread over 42 days. But by the late 1990s, um, people began to, saw, began to see that dexamethasone had a very harmful effect. It actually increased the incidence of cerebral palsy among these infants who were given dexamethasone. This led to a lot of clinicians abandoning the routine use of dexamethasone in treating or preventing BPD. However, over the next few years, the rate of BPD started to climb again. This was around um, 2000, the early 2000. Despite all the other improvements that we were trying to do um, for the early neonatal care of these preterm infants, this eventually sparked a renewed interest in research on dexamethasone, particularly at lower doses and shorter duration. Remember, I earlier told you that um, people were using dexamethasone at very, very high doses and um, very early on. And this resulted to the increased incidence of cerebral palsy um, among these preterm infants. Okay. Um, because of the increase um, in the rates of BPD, people now started to focus on low-dose dexamethasone and the possibility that it might be able to prevent or at least swing the, pen, the worsening pendulum um, for BPD, uh, especially for these extremely premature infants. Um, there were a lot of trials. However, no um, RCT was able to come up with a very definitive conclusion regarding the use of low-dose corticosteroids. However, very pivotal um, in the renewed interest in the, low, in the use of low-dose dexamethasone was a result of the meta-regression analysis of Doyle in 2014, which basically showed that for infants with a high risk of developing BPD, postnatal corticosteroids reduce the chances of death or cerebral palsy, hence the development of the DART protocol, which was studied as early as 2016. Other um, most recent R RCTs um, include hydrocortisone, which we will talk about later, uh, the largest of which is the PREMILAC trial and um, the ongoing um, inhaled and intra intratracheal um, um, administration of corticosteroids to prevent or treat BPD. Dexamethasone, as we all know, is a potent anti-inflammatory agent. Uh, postulated mechanisms of action for the use um, in BPD include the following. One, it decreases inflammation in the developing lung. And second, it decreases the cytokine-mediated secondary insults to the preterm lung from non-infectious exposures such as high level of oxygen and mechanical ventilation. When we look at the... Um, 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 advantages, the benefits of dexamethasone. Um, we look at the early um, and the late administration of dexamethasone. When we talk about early use, we talk about less than two weeks after birth for inhaled corticosteroids or less than um, eight days after birth for systemic corticosteroids. And we talk about late administration, it's more than seven days for both inhaled corticosteroids and for um, um, systemic um, corticosteroids, and this is usually given over a prolonged period of time. Of the 32 trials that randomized almost 4,000 babies, the early systemic use of dexamethasone was shown to have beneficial short-term effects, including lower rates of extubation failure, BPD, um, the, uh, the cumulative outcome of death or B BPD, BDA and severe retinopathy of prematurity. There were also other adverse side effects noted, such as GI bleeding, intestinal perforation, hyperglycemia, hypertension, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and growth failure. Very interesting um, that alongside um, the increase in the incidence of cerebral palsy noted with the 
early use of dexamethasone, there was also a lot of concern regarding the increased incidence of spontaneous intestinal perforation, especially when dexamethasone was used within the first week of life. Aside from these um, adverse um, short-term effects, um, as I mentioned, dexamethasone had this potent effect on increasing the, in, um, the incidence of cerebral palsy, especially when it's given early and over a prolonged course of time. Benefits of administering de dexamethasone later include a decrease in mortality at 28 days, a decrease in extubation failure, BPD, um, the combined outcome of mortality or BPD, and the need for late rescue dexamethasone. They also noted an increasing trend towards risk of infection, GI bleeding, hyperglycemia, glycosuria, hypertension, and severe ROP. Necrotizing enterocolitis and blindness were not increased. However, one of the big finding, one of the significant findings um, from these trials showed that there was no significant difference in the neurodevelopmental um, development of these infants when dexamethasone was given late and the incidence of CP as opposed to when you give dexamethasone early, which is less than seven um, days of life. Uh, let's talk now about hydrocortisone. So hydrocortisone became the focus of research interest when the concerns about dexamethasone therapy and CP were at their peak. The rationale behind this was that low-dose hydrocortisone was more physiologic than dexamethasone, and therefore the side effects were less. And second, um, the, there was this observation that babies who went on to develop BP had significantly lower cortisol secretion in response to ACTH than those who did not. To date, the largest hydrocortisone trial is called the Primilac uh, trial, which basically randomized almost 523 infants, all less than 28 weeks just the, um, of gestational age. All were given uh, 10 days of either hydrocortisone or placebo that were started from birth. Um, it showed significantly an improved decrease in the rate of BPD. 51% in the hydrocortisone treated group versus 60% in the placebo group. Similar adverse neurodevelopmental outcomes were observed in both treatment groups. However, one thing that was noted um, as a subset analysis was that these neurodevelopmental outcomes were different when you look at those who were extremely premature, particularly those who are 24 to 25 weeks gestation. A subset analysis of this same group also showed an increasing trend towards late onset, ses late onset sepsis. Um, there was no difference in GI perforation, leukocytosis, hypertension, nor hyperglyc hyperglycemia. Uh, seen in both treatment groups. In light of these findings, it is likely that early hydrocortisone treatment is beneficial in preventing BPD, but only, only in a specific population of infants, especially those who are born extremely premature. Um, currently, this finding has led to the use of hydrocortisone um, to be adopted into uh, the practice of most neonatal units here in, a, in the United States and in Europe. Um, it will be actually very interesting to see the data that emerges over the coming years. However, a lot of clinicians, including me, are still erring on the side of caution and awaiting consensus from further full-powered studies. Com Comparing the two corticosteroids, both medications similarly decrease the risk of BPD, whether given early or delayed. But in terms of the risk of adverse neurodevelopmental outcome, CP is more common with dexamethasone compared to hydrocortisone. Why is this so? Um, several reasons. So hydrocortisone binds to both glucocorticoid and mineral corticoid receptors, which is very akin to endogen endogenous cortisol, ergo 
it seems to be more physiologic than dexamethasone. In contrast, dexamethasone only binds to glucocorticoid receptors. Um, and consequent neuronal apoptosis in animal models have been seen and described, which may in part explain the association between dexamethasone and the adverse long-term neurodevelopmental outcome in preterm infants. Moreover, dexamethasone exerts a direct toxic effect on the neural tissue and growth restriction, whether systemically or within the brain. This assumption was actually supported by a significant decrease seen in the cerebral volume when, um, when a cranial MRI was done on the infants who were treated with dexamethasone. This decrease in cerebral volume was approximated to be at least 10%. Weighing up the current evidence, there are benefits and harms in the short term, but serious long-term harms associated with early use of systemic postnatal corticosteroids, especially dexamethasone. It is wise, therefore, to use early systemic uh, postnatal corticosteroids judiciously to prevent BPD in clinical practice. Current um, guidance from the neonatal, from the National Institute for Health and care, and care uh, that's based in UK states that practitioners should consider dexamethasone to reduce the risk of BPD, but only for preterm babies who are eight days older and still need invasive ventilation for respiratory disease. I'll be talking about the DART protocol, which um, is largely what I actually use in practice now, especially when I want to wean an infant from high ventilatory settings, or if I see that um, I would like to um, trial extubation on this infant. Um, nevertheless, it still highlights that um, risk factors should be considered when choosing which infant to treat and emphasize that, that possible harm must be discussed with the, pre, with the parents prior to the commencement of treatment. This is what we call compassionate use here um, in the United States. In fact, when I was a fellow, um, before we would um, start using dexamethasone, we would actually uh, sit down with the parents, talk to them about the risk factors that are associated with dexamethasone, and the parents do need, um, do need to sign um, that they consent um, to this um, form of therapy, knowing that their son or daughter may have um, may be at risk for neurodevelopmental impairment um, in the future. Um, the NISE guide uh, guidelines actually summarize their evidence by providing some helpful numbers. They actually said that without dexamethasone, 63 babies out of 100 would develop BPD whereas with dexamethasone, 47 babies per 100 would develop it. The only side effect with reasonable evidence so far um, was that more babies develop hypertension. Risk of GI bleeding, GI perforation, and CP cannot still be fully excluded at present. Now, this is where um, I now talk about the DART protocol, which is the most widely used protocol for low-dose dexamethasone that is currently um, in practice now. It was first studied in 2006 and fully implemented in 2016. Um, it, in, it actually involves low-dose um, uh, dexamethasone with a total cumulative dose of 0.89 milligram per kilo spread over 10 to 12 days. The initial trial was very encouraging as it showed successful intubation in a lot of infants in the trial arm uh, versus 12% of infants in the control group. Um, it also demonstrated a significant decrease in the duration of mechanical ventilation and oxygen requirement. Hence, if, for example, you have an infant uh, who's, um, who's been on high vent settings for a prolonged period of time, um, we usually um, attempt DART protocol and see if the baby is going to respond. And from my um, practice, anecdotally, at least half of the um, infants that we start the DART protocol are actually weaned um, significantly from their previous vent settings or are even weaned towards extubation. 
more importantly, we did not see any increased incidence of hyperglycemia, hypertension, or intestinal perforation when low-dose dexam dexamethasone was used. This is just um, uh, the dose, uh, the weaning dose um, of the dexamethasone that we give here in our unit that spread over 12 days. So practice points to emphasize so far are the following. Low-dose dexamethasone courses, as in the DART protocol, after seven days of life may be considered in babies at high risk of developing severe BPD or babies um, with high vent settings to aid extubation. And second, physiologic hydrocortisone for 10 days, as shown by the Primilac trial, can decrease BPD and rates of PDA ligation. It can actually be protective um, in most vulnerable babies, especially those who are less than 20, um, to, who are 24 to 25 weeks gestation. However, its success has yet to be replicated in other RCTs. And my advice, we all still have to be cautious about its uh, routine use. Um, just a brief um, discussion on inhaled steroids. Um, so inhaled steroids, usually we use beclomethasone, budesonide, fluticasone, um, and some units actually use flunisolide. Uh, they're actually used on vent ba vented babies uh, for as long as, um, for up to four weeks of duration. The largest trial for early use of inhaled steroids currently is the neonatal European uh, study of inhaled steroids um, in 2015 that actually employed almost 800 um, infants who were 23 to 27 weeks of gestation. Uh, they were randomized um, into the budesonide um, group or the control group, which were both given within the first 24 hours of life. This trial showed that the rate of BPD was significantly lower in the treatment group. However, there was a slight trend um, towards increased mortality in the budesonide group. There were no other differences seen in side effects such as hyperglycemia, hypertension, infection, neurodevelopmental outcomes, or hospitalization between 18 months to three years. In terms of its late use, a meta-analysis by Cochrane Review in 2017 just merely showed that um, inhaled steroids, particularly budesonide, has a very small short-term benefit of reducing the risk of failure to extubate. However, when you talk about the combined outcomes of death or BPD or the single um, outcome of death or BPD, there was actually no difference whether the baby received it or not. The most promising trial at present for inhaled steroids um, are the two trials by Ye. Um, wherein he actually combined budesonide mixed with surfactant and were given to babies um, um, who were less than 1,500 grams, who had RDS, who were either intubated or who were intubated and ventilated, um, who were less than four hours of life and requiring more than 50%. Um, oxygen. He's actually still in the process of enrolling more, but currently he has had close to almost 400 infants now enrolled. What he actually showed here is very promising and very encouraging because he showed that infants who were given um, this mixture of surfactant and budesonide had a significant reduction in the development of BPD by as much as 36% without affecting adverse neurodevelopmental in, um, outcomes um, in babies when they were followed at 18 to 24 months of age. The number to treat to prevent BPD and the number to, to treat uh, to prevent BPD or death uh, was five and four respectively. Very, very impressive. Because when you talk of the most, um, of the most encouraging treatment to prevent BPD, it's actually vitamin A, um, and it's number to treat is 12. So this is actually very, very good. Um, he's still, as I said, he's still in the process of um, um, enrolling more infants and following these infants to school age. Um, 
So I'm, I'm actually uh, coming close to the end of the um, lecture. So um, basically corticosteroids um, in summary are effective in reducing BPD, um, but the concerns about harm need to temper their use. For the choice of corticosteroids, there's still most evidence around the efficacy of systemic corticosteroids, more so with dexamethasone in preventing or treating BPD. If given to infants at highest risk of BPD, postnatal dexamethasone would potentially pro be protective against complications like death or CP. Some evidence points to the efficacy of systemic um, and to a lesser degree inhaled budesonide in improving short-term respiratory outcomes. But we still need um, more data, especially long-term data um, from RCT trials. With regard to the timing of administration, um, it would be prudent to avoid giving systemic corticosteroids less than seven days after birth as the risk of CP is highest when given early. Hydrocortisone is potentially associated with fewer neurological side effects compared with dexamethasone if given early, but there are few data on long-term neurodevelopmental um, outcome, especially for the delayed therapy with um, hydrocortisone. With inhaled corticosteroids, whether it's given early or delayed, um, systematic reviews do not really suggest any adverse neurodevelopmental outcome at two to three years, but really the benefits are few. Um, and as of the current um, um, time, more data are still required to look into its real efficacy and long-term outcome. As, I, as we discussed earlier, earlier um, the early trials of intracranial, uh, in intratracheal budesonide surfactant shows the greatest promise in reducing BPD, but firm recommendations about its clinical use will need to wait until the current RCT is completed. So just to sum everything up, BPD continues to affect a significant number of very preterm infants, despite um, the advances in early neonatal care. It is therefore vital to continue to seek the best postnatal corticosteroid regimen to prevent or treat BPD in preterm infants. While there is some evidence to guide the use of systemic corticosteroids, other modes of administration, such as intratracheal uh, budesonide with surfactant, may be preferable. Results of current trials um, are being awaited. Um, and personally, I would um, err on the cautious side and see more um, long-term um, outcome, especially with the Premilox study. These are just um, some of the emerging potential therapies, aside from postnatal corticosteroids that are currently being studied to prevent or treat um, BPDs. And that's the end of my discussion. Thank you very much.